You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Oh. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. OK, quite a variety then. Hmm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12 and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> it would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes, but we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. OK. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks. That is the end of part one.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions eleven to seventeen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to seventeen. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first, and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that. You're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district, but we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions: the lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, The little-known military museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There's a junior wall and a crèche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sights tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions eighteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions eighteen to twenty. Naturally, there is a charge for all these attractions, but you can get fifteen percent off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs ten dollars. But this year, it's just seven dollars. When you hand it in, you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, everywhere you see a red Explorer symbol. Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 3. You are going to hear a conversation among Dr. Archer, Larry, and Judy, talking about the new term. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and complete the notes and table below. Okay, everybody. Welcome back to the new term. I hope you've all had a good break and that you're keen to start on your research project. What I'd like to do this morning is to give you a chance to ask questions about the project. Requirements, ways of approach, how to get help if you need it. Today is informal. It may be already written on paper, but it's nice to have an opportunity to have it confirmed. So, any questions? Dr. Archer, is there a confirmed due date yet to hand it in? Yes, I can now confirm that it's 16th of July, not 15th as first advised, OK? And what about the word limit? Well, there is some flexibility on this, but in general it's eight to 10,000 words. Ah, I see. And you can choose your topic, anything from years two and three. Yes? I still can't work out what I want to do it on. Who, um... In that case, you should see your course tutor to agree on your final topic. And you should also be aware that there is special assistance available at the library on library resources if you need help on that. Can I just check on the deadlines for everything? Certainly. Look, let me write it on the board when each stage should be completed. First of all, you've got to work on your basic project outline, and that's due in to your course tutor by 21st of February, which is only two weeks away, so you need to get cracking on that. Do we have to include a full reference list by then too? No, your reference list is due on 6th of April, which is one week later, so you have time to discuss this with your tutor. And when should we be doing the research? Well, that's over a one-month period, essentially April to May. And the write-up? Well, you need to do quite a bit of research before you get going on your writing. So that's really May to July, with a due date for handing in on the 16th. Any more questions? Now look at questions 27 to 30. Listen to the second part of the talk and match A, B, or C with questions 27 to 30. Well, sir, just some advice, really. It's about the research approach. Would you advise us to use some case studies? Well, Larry, I know these can be difficult to arrange sometimes, but I really feel they are of great benefit in this subject. You can always talk to your tutor if you're having difficulty. Yes? I've looked over some previous research projects that are in the library. Is that a good idea, sir? I heard. OK. I don't think you should go through them in detail, especially at this early stage, or you might end up being influenced by them more than you realise. But yes, it really is about the best guide you can have to what's required in the... to what's expected in this type of project. Sorry, Judy, I butted in on you. That's all right. It's just that I noticed one project was a joint one. They work together as a pair. Is that a good idea? Yes, I remember that paper. Working in a pair can have some advantages. But to be frank, this is meant to be an individual project, so it's best to work on your own. About using subjects, is it OK if we use family members? Your own relatives? I don't see why not. They probably offer some advantages in terms of availability. 
although you need to guard against possible effects on your research outcomes. So, you can if you want. Perhaps you should discuss this with your tutor if you plan to use relatives, so you can approach it in the best way. Okay, okay thanks. thanks. Okay then. Well, I hope we've been able to sort out a few things. You're welcome to see me at any time, or drop me a note if you have any more queries. Fine, Fine thanks. thanks. That is the end of part three. Now you have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a media studies tutor giving a lecture about news sources. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 35. Okay, now many of you will have heard about the predicted death of newspapers as people increasingly access the TV and the Internet for their news. Today, I want to look at the USA, which has very advanced news sources, to see if this is actually true. In the USA, the main news sources without doubt are TV, the Internet, and the press. That is, traditional newspapers. And although they are each surviving and growing, they are also changing. Obviously, TV news has been around for a while, and the early evening bulletins, when people get in from work, are very popular. I suppose we traditionally think of the morning newspaper arriving on our doorstep with the daily news, Interestingly, this is not borne out by the statistics, which show that readership in the U.S. is much higher when people have time to relax, when they're not working, especially on Sundays. The Internet is also a popular weekend activity, but shows no variation with weekday access. So people are using the different sources in different ways. Interestingly, local radio has been hit less by the grip of quite strong local newspapers than by the Internet, which is seen to offer a better regional service. But just because the Internet is seen as the new force in news media does not mean it is dominant. Television has, of course, been global for a while. But now, technological changes, which have fueled the rise of online news, have also allowed newspapers to print and distribute editions across the world. In fact, Internet news, which is seen as the big competitor for traditional markets, does not offer that much variety. Often, the sources are the online versions of the newspapers, whereas television in order to offer something different, has had to come up with a much more mixed bag of reporting, from hard news to light reports on celebrity events. Another issue is reliability. The Internet is virtually unregulated, so anything can be reported there, whether true or not. Journalists on newspapers have fought a long, hard battle to fight intervention and to retain the freedom of the press. Television, however, is seen as critical to political power and has become subject to harsh controls about what it can or cannot say. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 36 to 40.
Now, one very critical factor in keeping newspapers alive and well in the USA has been their approach to advertising. Obviously, newspapers are heavily dependent on advertising revenue, and they have become more and more imaginative in what they offer in order to make sure that advertisers use them and not other news sources. This has meant that, contrary to popular belief, newspapers now have a significantly higher profit margin than the rest of American industry. So, how have they managed to raise advertising revenue in this way? Well, they have put a lot of effort into developing and maintaining a very strong association with the retail trade. And they've come up with a winner. A critical tool in their sales plan has been suggesting that the adverts they run can have vouchers. This has been enormously effective because they have found that not only do more people buy the paper to get the discounts, but also that this inevitably means much higher sales for the clients who advertised. As well as doing this, the newspapers have also introduced aggressive sales campaigns over the last few years. This has resulted in a significant and continuing rise in the number of advertisers prepared to pay the extra for full-page ads. So, what I would like to move on to... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.